Hey guys, I'm Sarah LaVon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am back to keep talking all about gestational diabetes. And by back, I mean this is part two, all about it. So if you haven't seen the first video, pause this one, go to part one, and then come on back to pick up on that conversation. Today, I'm gonna talk all about what happens if you test positive for gestational diabetes, how it impacts the rest of your pregnancy, and then what to expect going into your labor and birth. More topics are coming at you soon, all sorts of stuff related to pregnancy and birth and postpartum. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe down below and then let's get to it. So you've been tested for gestational diabetes and now you're positive and you're probably freaking out and I want to be your pep talker to say, this is nothing to freak out about. We're gonna take it with a grain of salt. We're gonna pick up what we can control. We're gonna let go of the rest. It is what it is at this point, okay? It's not the end of the world. So if you are positive for gestational diabetes, and again, if you haven't seen part one, go over there and learn all about what it is and while they test you, and then they'll test you, you're positive, they say, oh, you have gestational diabetes. I want you to know what the signs are of your blood sugar being high or low because it is important that you're kind of paying attention to your own symptoms because if you have gestational diabetes, you are gonna be at higher risk of your blood sugar being too high or too low. The goal is your sugar is regulated, meaning it's stable and it may be stable through medications or it may be stable just through changing your diet and your lifestyle. So what would happen if you had high blood sugar? Normally, you are going to have some of those same signs that if you have high blood sugar before you've been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, sometimes you have symptoms, sometimes you don't. But if it's too high, you're gonna be extra thirsty. You might have a headache, you might have vision changes, so like blurry vision, which again has to do with preeclampsia, but I'm getting to that. So you wanna think about not just those two, that's an alert, hey, it could be preeclampsia, it could be gestational diabetes, because it is true that if you have gestational diabetes, you do have a higher risk of preeclampsia, video coming soon. So headache and vision changes, and then extra peeing, more than normal for pregnancy, and then kind of just feeling tired, lethargic, thirsty, hungry, those can be signs that, you're, that your sugar is high. If your sugar is high, you're likely going to be testing your blood sugar at home. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Now, if your sugar is low, you might feel a little shaky, you might feel dizzy, you might be really sweaty. Um, and sweating can actually happen when it's high too, but more often when it's low, you might be extra hungry, sort of moody, like you're you're all really snappy all of a sudden. And then it can lead to delirium. I had a, I had a friend, a roommate in college, that she had type one diabetes, and that's like a whole nother separate thing. If you have diabetes going into pregnancy, you're gonna continue to have diabetes in your pregnancy, and you're gonna have to be extra regulated because your sugars are gonna be influenced by the pregnancy hormones. But for her, when her blood sugar would go low, she would turn into like an animal. Like it was like she was completely delirious. We had to like tackle her to the ground and put frosting in her teeth. Like, and mind you, that is like an extreme case of type one diabetes. But if all of a sudden she turns crazy on you and she has diabetes, you might wanna give her like a hard candy or something or throw some like sugar in her mouth to increase her blood sugar. We really care about your sugars being normal. Now that's for you and then that's also for the impact on the baby. Once you're diagnosed with gestational diabetes, your doctor will likely set you up with a nutrition consult because your diet is gonna matter more than really anything. And some of you may need to move on to medications and either take a pill or actually give yourself insulin, but most of the time, the first line of treatment is just your diet changes. So you're paying attention to what you're eating. You're eating low glycemic index foods, and so, I'll actually probably make an Instagram post about this. So if you go over to Instagram, I will do a post on what are some low glycemic index foods, which actually are just good for us in general. It's good for us not to be eating a lot of processed stuff, white breads, white flours, artificial sugars, all of that is just not good for us in general. But particularly if you have gestational diabetes, you wanna be limiting that amount of stuff. Even fruits, depending on how strong your, your testing was or how, how like intense the disease process is working on in your body, you, you're gonna wanna pay attention to the sugary things that you eat and decrease them, increasing your good fats, increasing your proteins and other lower glycemic index carbohydrates to fuel your body, help your baby grow without spiking your blood sugar to a place of it being way too high 
And then the other side of that for the low side is that you want to make sure that you're eating super regularly. And by eating, that's like little nuts or like some sort of little snack here and there to regulate your blood sugar so you don't have these big spikes of like you eat and it's so high and then you're like, oh, I don't eat forever and now I'm low. You want to keep your sugars regulated, keep them normal. And so by eating regularly, that's gonna help you. Now mind you, that also helps you if you're just pregnant in general because of you feeding a baby and growing a baby. It's just good for you to eat small frequent meals. It's kind of a rule of thumb, particularly for gestational diabetes. So if you have gestational diabetes, pay attention to your symptoms, get set up with that nutrition consult so they can teach you about how you should be eating for your pregnancy. Immediately just start paying attention to what you're eating. Maybe start a food log and write down what you've been eating because that nutritionist is gonna be like, whoa, you are way ahead of the game. Look at this, this is so helpful and they can help you to regulate your diet. And then hopefully that's enough that you maybe increase your exercise if you're not exercising already. I'm not saying go like train for a marathon right now, but I'm saying get outside and get moving. That is really gonna help to regulate your blood sugar. The other thing is your doctor will likely set you up with a home testing kit. So you like even go to the pharmacy and you can get the little finger pricker thing. And if you've seen my modern fertility thing, I have this, this highlight on my Instagram where I had to prick my own finger. It is rough. So I have so much sympathy for you mamas who have to prick your finger on the regular. It is so intense. You will get used to it likely, but you will likely have to be testing your sugars maybe once, usually twice a day, maybe more often depending on what's going on with your body. But they'll help get you set up with that home testing kit so that you can learn about how to test your sugars and make sure that they are stable and then know how to respond if they're too high or even too low. Now, if they're too low, you just gotta like have something sweet. So like, I say a hard candy, but we're trying to stay away from the processed sugars. So like a tea with honey in it or an apple or something on the sweeter side, but maybe not like Swedish fish. I don't know why Swedish fish always comes up for me, but it seems to always come up. I really like me a Swedish fish. So you're testing your sugars regularly and then you're keeping a log because your doctor's gonna ask for that. Now mind you, they're gonna talk you through all of this. You're just gonna be way ahead of the game because you've had the education. So let's say that you've been doing all the things. You've been walking all of a sudden, you're increasing your exercise and your movement, you're eating well, you're taking your sugars and they're still high. The next line of treatment would likely be medication. So you would take a pill to help regulate that blood sugar, keep it stable. Or if that's not working, they may have you inject yourself with insulin, which is a tiny little needle, super fun. You would regulate the number. They would teach you all about how much to give. You draw it up and then you'd pinch your fat and like stick yourself with the needle. We had to do it in nursing school and honestly it wasn't as bad as it sounded. You don't even really feel it because these are like the tiniest needles in the entire world, but it still is not fun. And to think about pricking yourself, it's a bummer. So let's not get there and really work hard to do all the things that you can, what you can control, and decrease and regulate your blood sugar yourself. So why do we care that your sugar is regulated or stable? Because when you have that free floating glucose or sugar in your, in your body and your blood sugar is high over time and there's like insulin spikes and decreases and unstableness in your body, it puts your baby at risk for what's called macrosomia, which is just a big baby. And everybody's worried about big baby. Everybody talks about big baby. So I don't want you to stress about this. You want your sugar to be regulated because you don't want a huge baby, right? Think about your vagina. You don't want a huge, massive baby coming out your vagina if you can control it. So we want baby smaller, but the other really true risk is because we want it to be able to fit through your pelvis, okay? And if it's huge, you are at higher risk for a C-suction and you are at higher risk for an induction, I will say. I'm getting to that when we talk about what to expect for labor and delivery. But big baby is one of the biggest things that we care about related to your pregnancy going forward being at risk with gestational diabetes. Now with big baby comes a complication in birth called shoulder dystocia. And that is where once the head is out, the shoulders get stuck in the pelvic bones. And so it does end up potentially becoming an emergency because once we're there, we need baby to like come on out. And if it gets stuck, then what do we do? We need baby like out rather than stuck and in and hanging out yet. So we want to get the baby through, but it can cause other complications. It can be very scary for you. We want to avoid the baby getting stuck in your pelvis. I mentioned this before, but if you have gestational diabetes, you are at higher risk for preeclampsia. Again, video coming soon, but that's just basically high blood pressure in pregnancy, although it's a little more complicated than that, but you get the idea. And then polyhydramnios is another big one. You just create more amniotic fluid, which the more fluid around the baby, we, we like in general for there to be fluid around the baby, but we don't want too much fluid because then your uterus gets over distended or overstretched out, which can cause complications. 
and there's a ton of space for that cord to get all nice and twisted and around and up and down and everywhere. And so we want there to be enough fluid, but not like a whole extra lot of fluid. Everybody's worried about the baby and complications of the baby. So big baby in general is just like a big baby. Like they're super cute with their little rolls and like it is what it is as long as it comes out of you. That's step one. But number two is that when baby's inside of you, that extra glucose is going to pass through the placenta to the baby. So meaning more sugar in the baby's bloodstream, which causes their own pancreas, amazing, right? To produce its own insulin to help regulate the sugar. So they've had this increased insulin flowing through the entire pregnancy probably, or at least since you've had gestational diabetes. And then all of a sudden they're born, the cord gets cut, and now there's no more of that extra glucose or that extra sugar going to them from the placenta and the cord. And now their body's still producing that much insulin. So they're at increased risk for hypoglycemia or low blood sugar after birth because their body's like, oh, I only know to create this much insulin when they really don't need that much insulin because now their body's taking over their own production of blood sugar. Which leads me into what to expect from your labor and birth. So number one with baby, Really for baby, it doesn't make a difference through labor and birth. Like we're paying attention to your sugars, I'll get to that. But for after birth is when we really care for the baby. We want it to fit once it fits and comes out because of that increased risk of hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, and low blood sugar in a newborn can be very serious. We really don't want their sugar getting too low. And so they're gonna have to test your baby and their sugar. Now that in general is like a prick on their heel. You test the sugar, it sucks for them. I'm sorry, welcome to the world. It's gonna be okay. And then if their sugar is low, first line of treatment ideally is breast milk, but if that if it's too low and they're not breastfeeding, then they may need an IV with some sugar water. They're gonna need to be monitored and they'll just be monitored in your labor and delivery room. The nurse is watching for signs of low blood sugar. They're testing the blood sugar and being hyper aware that like, hey, this could happen with this baby. Doesn't always happen with the baby, but we do wanna be aware and also be testing the sugar of the baby to make sure that we don't have a low blood sugar issue. So backtrack to labor and delivery slash the rest of your pregnancy. So for the rest of your pregnancy, you can expect to see the doctor, be seeing your specialist more regularly. They're gonna see you maybe even weekly starting around 32 weeks, but that's flex and flow based on different doctor's criteria and how your disease process is functioning in your body. But you're gonna see your doctor a little bit more and that is really the only risk to treatment. It's better to know and then see your doctor more often than not. So you're gonna get to know them very well for the rest of your pregnancy. And then as you get closer to delivery, there is a higher chance that you might need to be induced just based on the size of baby, and this is a little flexible. I will say, and I talk about this in my preventing a C-section video, that if you have gestational diabetes, they they really can't say that you have to have a C-section until the estimated fetal weight is above 4,500 grams, which is like, I think like 11 pounds something, I don't know what it is, but it's like a really big baby, okay? And it's estimated fetal weights are estimated. So this gets me on my soapbox, I always talk about this, you've heard it before, but big baby is typically not a reason for a C-section. But with gestational diabetes, there's a little bit of a caveat to that, that we just wanna be aware, because if your baby is enormous, like we're talking 12 pounds estimated, it may be safer for you to have a C-section. That's definitely something for you to discuss with your doctor and work that out, work out the kinks, figure it out for yourself, and also think about what's most important to you. So you have a little higher risk of induction, you have a little higher risk of a C-section, especially if your baby's above 4,500 grams, they can schedule it for a medical reason in that case. And then once you're in labor, in theory, you go into labor on your own, you labor at home. Again, this is always with the with the background of like, unless your doctor says so. So of course, they're gonna trump everything that I say, but otherwise you're laboring at home, you go into labor and delivery when it's time, when you're actually in active labor, you'll learn about that in my childbirth class. And then they keep you, they will check your sugar on admission. Different hospitals have different protocols, but at least once for sure, no matter if you're diet controlled or you have to take medications for your gestational diabetes, they're gonna check your blood sugar if it's normal. Some people, that's literally it. That's all it is for the rest of your labor and birth. They'll check the baby's sugar afterwards and maybe check yours, maybe not. Watch for signs that your sugar's high or low. You'll be on an IV to help stabilize your sugar because you're probably not eating anything when you're in the hospital. And that's really the only impact. Now, if you were taking insulin during your pregnancy, then yes, of course, you're going to have an IV. They're going to check your sugar, and then they're probably going to check your sugar more regularly throughout labor, even as often as
as one hour, more often every two hours to four hours, depending on what stage of labor that you're in. If your sugar's high in labor, then they would put you on an insulin drip. So you would be on IV insulin. And remember, insulin is what lowers the blood sugar because we want it stable. That's also really good for the baby as well, because if your sugar's super high right before you deliver and the stress of labor can increase your sugar. So it's gonna make your sugars a little more out of control. That's why we care to check it. But if your sugar's super high in labor and then all of a sudden baby's born, that sugar being high is where they left off. So likely they're gonna be more at risk for a hypoglycemia or a low blood sugar. So we want them also regulated during labor and birth, where it's really important that we test you. But that's really it, guys. Little finger poke, you're good. We keep going. If it's high, they adjust your insulin drip. And we trust that the medication is there to help you and help regulate those sugars. And then hopefully your baby fits through your pelvis. You don't have a shoulder dystocia. Your baby ends up being just nice and little chunky, but just chunky enough to fit through and come out and not tear you like crazy. And then we don't have a C-section and then we check the sugar of the baby and that's literally it. Occasionally they'll check your sugar after birth, but otherwise this is not like, oh, I can't have the birth experience of my dreams. Oh, I have no options. You may have a little bit more limited options with being a high risk pregnancy. But other than that, guys, like we are letting go and we are still gonna control what we can control. That's our environment, that's who's there. That's all the things I talk about in my childbirth class and all my other, <laughs> other videos that you hopefully have watched. And if you haven't, there's lots of other information on here. Just keep staying tuned and watching these videos. If you have any other questions, this is just opening up the conversation. You can always throw them in the comment box down below. Now, I am not your authority. I do not know your own specific pregnancy. So I highly encourage you to take this information, use it as a foundation to encourage a dialogue with your provider, whether that be doctor, midwife, probably doctor in this case, and then continue to ask them, what are the risks? What do you expect from this? How do I know X, Y, Z for me? And what can I expect for labor and birth going into it with gestational diabetes? So please don't stress about this, guys. If you are diagnosed with gestational diabetes, it is not the end of the world. There are things you can pick up that you can control, and then there are other things you can't control. You can be the healthiest person with the best diet, exercising all the time with the most normal weight, and still end up with gestational diabetes. And if it happens, Happens, we're gonna flex and flow and go with it. It is okay. There are ways to manage it. The thing is you do want to be treated. You do want to be tested for it. And you want to be aware of the signs so that they're not, you're not doing the up and down thing with your blood sugars. But remember that only about 6% of the population in the United States has gestational diabetes. So this is common, but it's not that common. And if it happens, it's something that we see all the time. We'll test, we'll treat, we'll figure out depending on where your sugars are at. And then once you deliver, it goes away. But in general, you got a solid foundation going forward. If you have any other questions, throw them in the comment box. I can answer them on a coffee and questions. And then if you want more from me, you can go to my website. I got childbirth classes over there. That's such a good foundation to build off of when you add in all this supplemental stuff that I'm giving you here on YouTube. You can go to Instagram. I got lots more over there. You can work one-on-one -on -one with me. You know the spiel. Feel free to reach out in whatever way. I am here for you. Thank you so much for being with me here today. Thank you for watching and caring and subscribing. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe down below. I would very much appreciate it. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow and I will see you soon. Bye. And by back, I mean this is tar part. <laughs> wow, wow, struggle, struggle bus. It's, 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 it's these. Your There's noises. Like, I know I make a lot of noise. Make a lot of little squeaky noises. I do. I smell great. <laughs> Don't even know what I'm saying. Oh gosh, home test, home, home testing. <laughs> okay. Look at the light, look at the light. It makes it go away. So why do we care? <laughs> Ooh, bless you. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> if the, if the, but on that side, if the, ja is, oh, wow, <laughs> okay. So if you take my chat, I may follow up in a comment on your, on your comment. Comment on your comment. That had nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay.